our second presentation on uh, on uh, ethics in the uh, in the formation of business entities is uh, Professor Harvey Gell, uh, who you've, we've already introduced in in, in a fashion. Uh, Professor Gell is uh, is the uh, Charles Kepler Chair in uh, Law and Leadership. I hope I got that right. So it's close to it, it's close to that, uh, and uh, a legendary and beloved member of our faculty, like like Jim before him. So. Uh, and and a double double Harvard grad from uh, but Tom already planned that. Um. Thank you. <clears throat> you know I feel <clears throat> a little bit. You know everybody who knows me <clears throat> pretty well knows that I sing a lot, and uh, <clears throat> and I sing in the halls, <laughs> and I don't realize I'm doing it. Uh, uh, and some people comment on they miss my singing if it, if it doesn't happen. But uh, I'm sure I'm really an amateur, uh, a complete amateur, in following uh, these two people uh, before me. Uh, it's like uh, following Bruce Springsteen and Tony Bennett. Uh, for me, uh, uh, it's very tough to follow <coughs> to follow such an act. Um, uh, yeah, Tom Long, of course, uh, is, is, his name is synonymous with outstanding legal practice in Wyoming and. Uh, he, uh, he has been very good to our students over the years, and I know they've gotten a lot of experience and mentoring at his office, and I, I really uh, <coughs> appreciate that. Uh, some of it, I've had <coughs> some of the same people as students while he's also had them on summer work, and uh, it's been really, I've learned a lot about him uh, from the people who've worked there. And you'll notice he's got a couple of people in his law firm. Uh, with, with him today. I see two. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. Also a former student of mine. Um, and I have a former student here from the class of 1981 uh, today. <laughs> I haven't seen him in quite, quite a few years. Um, and then uh, I have uh, a number of my current business planning students are here. Uh, and I, I advise them to come because this is a, a terrific way for them to learn about business planning. I didn't mean on my part necessarily, but on the part that just heard. <clears throat> uh, believe it or not, looking at me, uh, you would never know this, but I'm uh, a lawyer now for over 50 years. And, <laughs> and the, uh, I think uh, perhaps I've earned the right to pontificate a little bit about ethics. Um, having seen this over this uh, period of years, I'm kind of looking from more the top of the mountain after all these years of experience at the problem. And for, I, I have a few general points I want to make. And if you look at my uh, the top two pages, I outline what, some of the things that I think are important in organizing a business. And then I extracted some rules. They're not all the rules. Oh, by the way, you know, I forgot to say about Jim Delaney. Jim Delaney uh, <laughs> I don't want to make, forget about Jim Lee because I think he's a, he's a tremendous tax lawyer and in general a great lawyer. And he's added so much to the faculty here at the University of Wyoming College of Law. And I wouldn't say that if I didn't really mean it. And, yeah. <laughs> besides which, he, and besides which, his wife is an outstanding accountant, and I'm glad to hear she put two certain things. Thank you, sir. Uh, but. Uh, uh, and he learns from her, I'm sure, all the time. Um, but, uh, but Jim, uh, uh, Jim, it's been a pleasure to have him here with us. I go off and talk with him. I miss him this year. We don't see him in the hospital. Uh, I have a general, couple of general things that I want to say first. I, I want to just make a general comment as a lawyer. In over 50 years, he thinks he has a right to make some extra comments. Um, I think with, with what we're doing to creditors, and I'm not saying the current LLC law is, uh, it, it, is bad or won't work right, or, uh, uh, but I'm saying that we, we have to be very careful uh, because we've seen a lot of problems with, which creditors have been having and investors have been having over the years in collecting on things uh, where they've lent money and where they've uh, expended funds. And I think we have to be careful. I'm going to be a little cute here. 
that uh, we don't prefer the predators over the creditors. Uh, because uh, some people uh, do go into business and they don't care about financial responsibility. And uh, they, uh, in fact, uh, they don't care if they cheat their creditors either. So we have to, at some point, there's gotta be balance in the law where we're not taking away too many of the tools that creditors have uh, to protect themselves. Again, the new Wyoming law is, 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 is pretty, the LLC law is pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting in its creditor provisions, which they've gone over in depth. Uh, and these are big policy questions, which I would say we should pay, pay attention to as we move forward in legislating. The uh, second big point I want to make, and this does pertain, uh, we're, we're, we, we're at home and some of us, we teach our children and some of us, we want to be able to face our mothers and, uh, and not be ashamed and uh, our fathers too. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we're not schizophrenic about, about, to be a good person at home and in our normal lives, we don't discard that when we walk into our lofts. Rather, uh, we're supposed to be a good person, you know, uh, uh, the same good person in both places. The uh, rules of professional conduct, which, which we've attached here, are special rules that apply to the legal profession. And they're rules, um, uh, they're, they're rules that are based on ethical and moral concepts and, and the best way for us lawyers to conduct ourselves and live up to the kind of ethical and moral concepts that would be accept acceptable in our society. I, as they say, have pulled out a number of them which help us, but uh, as a general proposition, we have to be, um, we, have, we have to take our good person status right into, right into our professional status and not compromise on that. Unfortunately, some lawyers over the years have done that. And you know we see we see in, in the business world, uh, you know their clients go off and do things that maybe the lawyer could have prevented. You know one very famous judge in a case, famous statement he made: Where were the lawyers and the accountants when these folks did the things that they did? So uh, we have to live up to the traditions of our profession, which call for us to behave well and to be good. And if you just look at these rules of professional conduct. And you know, we had a business planning class not long ago, and Ryan was at the class. Uh, and one of the points that was made at the session was that from the beginning, we should advise our clients of, of the limitations that exist with respect to what we can do and what we can. And by the way, the dean was present too and contributed uh, very uh, helpfully to the discussion. So, uh, we're not shysters. Uh, we're not people who are gonna try to help them get away with improper behavior. That's not the point. And if you look at 1.2 in my rules of conduct that I pulled out, it says a lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct that the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent but the lawyer, but a lawyer may discuss the legal consequences of any proposed conduct. And I, I've often, you know, we get a, a rap from the public that we don't deserve at times, mostly, I hope, uh, that uh, somehow some people may think of us as the shyster lawyer, you know? Well, that's not really the way most lawyers are. Uh, I can't, I can think of how many times in the 18 years I practiced that I prevented somebody from doing something wrong. I mean, one of the main things we do is we help people not to do the wrong thing. And any of you who practiced it all know that. That's why confidentiality is so important. So they can talk to us about their problems and we can give them the right advice. But, but again, uh, uh, rule 1.2 is very important. And at that session, I think 
I got very excited by the idea that we ought to make it clear to clients that we're honorable and that we're following this, these kind of rules and that we're constrained by them in our, in our behavior and in our advice to them. And that also ties in uh, with, there's another rule here, which allows us to speak 2.1 Which, is, which allows, allows us to be an advisor in general to clients. In representing a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment and render candid advice. In rendering advice, a lawyer may refer not only to law, but to other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to the client's situation. Again, uh, this, uh, I think, at the business planning class that we had and that we've, that we've always had, we, we, we pretty much concluded that this is a very important part of the law practice. Being able to go beyond purely legal advice and being able uh, to give advice on these other factors uh, that come up. Now, what, have, what must we be careful about? We must be very careful that we we don't get uh, immodest in the advice that we give. And this, this can be a danger, too. Uh, modesty is a virtue, and we must realize our own limitations. I have known lawyers who, when they get domestic relations problems in their office, they think they're experts on marital relationships. Uh, I've known lawyers who are asked questions about investment, as I said to my class, I used to have people come to me and ask me for investment advice on convertible bonds. And I didn't know anything really about investing in convertible bonds. And I believe they confused me with my uncle, who was an expert on convertible bonds. But, but if you think about it, they expect us to know so much. You're a lawyer, aren't you? You, you know. And we have to be modest enough to uh, to say we don't know and not to give advice where we shouldn't give advice. Or they may come and say, how much should I sell my real estate for? We may not be in a position to tell them what the price of the real estate should be. We have to send them to the right uh, expert on that subject and so on. I mean, I'm sure those of you who are in practice have had that experience where people just think you know everything. The opinion of, of, of people about lawyers is that they're very knowledgeable and they often really like their own lawyer. A lot of the polls uh, that are negative about lawyers are about other people's lawyers. <laughs> they're not about their own lawyer who's fighting for them. And so I would say you have to have some judicial or, or, or lawyer-like restraint in knowing the areas that you can't be and we'll talk about competency in a few minutes. We'll discuss legal competency in terms of what you know and what you don't know. But I was very intrigued with the discussion between our two uh, eminent uh, uh, guests here about allocation, uh, uh, allocation of uh, economic benefits under these LLC or partnership type arrangements, which is very, very complicated and difficult uh, to figure out. I'm sitting there and I'm observing, uh, observing them. They talk about bringing in the accountant. And uh, at some point, I've read some people say, maybe in, in some of those situations, you even have to bring a tax lawyer in uh, with, with some of the complexities that are involved. So we have to have proper modesty. On the other hand, of course, uh, there are many things which we don't know when we start a matter, which we have to learn about. And that's perfectly proper too. But we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So anyway, uh, I guess I, I picked out my father-in-law, who is no longer with us. Uh, he would like the idea of my saying that there are five C's that I think about, you know, way to remember something. But in, in this discussion today, I'm thinking about five C's. I'm thinking about conflicts of interest, which, which really involve loyalty. 
And loyalty is a vital part of ethics. And those of you who had my class know that uh, I talk about a case called Meinhardt versus Salmon a great deal, which, which was a partnership case and which involved uh, one partner, uh, they called it a joint venture, but Cardozo was buying uh, partnership law, which is, which is pretty much done that way. And Cardozo applied it to protect the one partner from being treated badly by the other partner in a manner which he would say was disloyal, not really uh, the utmost good faith and loyalty which one partner owes to the other partner which a fiduciary owes. So conflicts of interest are very important. Also conflicts, you know, you could feel like you're being pulled with the hypothetical that I gave at the beginning. I don't know if you folks have had a chance to read it, the three people organizing the restaurant business. But you could be pulled in three different directions, particularly if you tried to represent all three of them. And I think most of us would, I think overwhelmingly, those of us with experience, would be afraid to represent all three persons in that hypothetical who came in. And we would probably uh, very quickly opt for representing the organization which will be formed rather than each person individually. And of course, uh, uh, I wrote, I, I listed a few items here just to illustrate the reason why Reason, reasons why I thought that to illustrate the conflicts and the reasons why I thought that it would be very difficult to be pulled in three different directions. And so what, is, what are we really trying to do when we're organizing a new business and trying to do it in an intelligent and honorable manner? I think overall what we're trying to do is develop mechanisms in the plan that we create, in the legal plan that we create to operate that business, mechanisms that will enable this business to function properly and to be successful. And where we run into problems that the entity that we're representing uh, may have a, a serious problem in dealing with one of the three then I think we have to very forcefully ask that person to get another attorney into the picture where that becomes a problem. And I left an opening on that, an illustration, uh, in terms of the, the, the person who owns the real estate. The person who owns the real estate, fully equipped restaurant property, will have a natural conflict with the organization which is going to use that property. And it's, it's a very risky proposition for you to be representing the organization and for that person uh, to perhaps make concede points uh, in the lease arrangement or in the transfer of the property or whatever is done with it. Uh, without having proper legal advice. So there, there are times even when you do represent the organization and not one of the three or two of the three or three of the three, that you still would insist that each of that a separate lawyer, at least for the one who's gonna have that particular problem, uh, be engaged. I would be very uncomfortable in dealing on that particular issue as the only lawyer in the picture. Well, let, let me look at why I, at 1A, what I see as some of the potential conflicts, issues among parties, and what I see is the effort that you are making to form the ideal uh, organization as best you can. And one of these problems that I jotted down here is management and power. And I put the words deadlock or oppression. Uh, if, if you've got a, a business that's running, you have the question of should I, should, should I prepare a mechanism whereby the majority always rules 
should I prepare a mechanism where there's got to be some unanimity on some issues? Should it be on all issues? And the problem is that if you have unanimity, uh, you, you, you're inviting deadlock. But some things may be so important that the people want to have unanimity on them. Uh, uh, one person may be worried about two others ganging up on her in the particular uh, situation. So uh, you're, you're working on the best plan that you can come up with to deal with the management uh, and power issues and to prevent the kind of deadlock or oppression of minority uh, interest in the business. And of course the deadlock could be very detrimental to the business. You talk about dissociation from the business and violence as another issue. Uh, somebody uh, wants to retire. Uh, maybe among the three of them, one is much older than the other two. Maybe you're, that person is assessing that I'm likely to be the first one to want to get out. The other two are young and maybe they, uh, have, they have a real conflict of interest because they know that's the one who's going to be pulling out first and, and much earlier than they are. Uh, dissolution of the business. Dissolution can be a, 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 a catastrophic development. If, if, uh, if you have a business going and it's a bad time for dissolving the business, it's another issue that should be considered. What should be the basis for ending the business? How do you terminate it? Again, some people may have their own interests. You're trying to form an entity that functions well. Uh, capital and loans. Uh, if each one is going to put in a certain amount of money, let's say $500,000 each one is going to put in. Should some of it be lent? Should some of it be invested as capital? If it's lent, uh, the company will be paying back interest and principal on a regular basis, presumably. If it's capital, it's subject uh, more to the vicissitudes of business and the risks involved, and we're not sure when some of that will be returned. Uh, expulsion possibilities. You want to have some sort of mechanism uh, for, with a partnership, for example, you would include in the agreement uh, some mechanism for expulsion, and typically that's without cause. But you want to have that in your, uh, in your mechanism for setting up the business that you hope will be successful. Withdrawal of profits from any entity. Withdrawal of profits may trigger taxes. Uh, some people may prefer, because of their own uh, economic position, to delay the withdrawal of profits. Uh, uh, some people may need the money very quickly and want money to be withdrawn. Uh, so you have certain conflicting interests there potentially with that problem. Uh, tax issues, uh, uh, which really relate to withdrawal of profits and other tax issues that may come up. Fiduciary duty. Uh, It is explained in, uh, in Tom's uh, outstanding uh, memo that uh, under this statute you can limit fiduciary duty to some extent, maybe even eliminate it. Is that yes. possible? Yes. yes, duty of loyalty and duty of care yes. can be eliminated, but not the duty of good faith, good faith and fair dealing. Yeah, so, uh, so again, uh, that's something um, which, uh, of course, is, uh, is beloved to me, fiduciary duty. I'd hate to see it uh, uh, eliminated. I think it's a serious step because I think it pr provides a certain degree of flexibility that if somebody's really doing something dirty to one or the others in the operation, uh, the courts will have some power over it. I know there's the other side of that argument that some people may be using it uh, as a hammer and improperly to get after uh, people who are just managing and making decisions as best they can. And it, it, but uh, I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. So anyway, that's conflicts and that's loyalty and that's why I say you have to uh, you have to really uh, 
You have to really decide not to represent each one, that's for sure. I mean, I can't say, I think that would be a nightmare. And I think you would go in with the entity uh, as your client. Now, <clears throat> communication would be the second thing that, that is very important. And my second C here, you have uh, conflicts and you have communication. Communication is very, very important. And I thought that Tom also, uh, using his sticks uh, approach, uh, was giving you an example, a great example, of a lawyer trying to explain something to his clients in a way that his clients could understand it. Uh, one of the biggest problems I had in the 18 years that I practiced law was getting people to, uh, to listen and to read and to understand what we were trying to do for them. And yet, uh, the, the rules are very clear. Uh, the uh, preamble, for lawyer's responsibilities, uh, item two, a lawyer performs various functions. As advisor, a lawyer provides a client with informed understanding. Informed understanding. Very, very difficult. Easy to say of the client's legal rights and obligations and explains their practical implications. I had clients who wanted to sign wills without reading them. Uh, where do I sign? And these are sometimes people who, who uh, accumulated a vast fortune in life as tough business people, and yet they wanted to give it all away without reading their own will. And I had to devise ways of, like dealing with children, of getting them to, to, to go over what's, what the will says and, and what they're really signing. Um, <laughs> you can't sign till the witnesses are in here, you know, <laughs> uh, for fear that they would sign too quickly. So, so anyway, communication is such an important part of it all. And, uh, and one of the things in, in communication is, is you actually, to the best of your ability, can go over the when you have documents, you go over the stuff with them and explain it to them as best as you can. A lawyer has to be an educator. A lawyer has to really be a teacher. A lawyer has to be able to explain things. If you want to achieve informed consent, you have to be able to explain uh, what you're doing to the client. And sometimes it gets difficult, particularly when you're talking about some of those partnership provisions uh, in the tax uh, area that you folks are talking about. I imagine that could get very difficult to explain. But drawing the line properly there and communicating with your clients is very, very important. <clears throat> Communication is a two-way street. It's not just you talking to the client. It's the client talking to you, too because you're supposed to ascertain what the client's needs are and what the client, uh, uh, what the relevant facts are of the client's situation. How do you do that? Well, you have, a lawyer should be a good listener. That's number one. Many of us in life aren't very good listeners. And we have to cultivate that uh, quality of being a good listener. Now, when you have your meeting to set up the organization and when you're having your your meetings with the, uh, with the client. And by the way, who's the client when you have an organization? The client are those people who are entitled to be representing the company. The, uh, the, the, the companies have their own uh, mechanical structures for who actually is in charge of the company. So you're talking to the people who are authorized to talk for the company. So um, that is, you know, you can't talk to a fictional entity, but you've got to have flesh and blood people that you're talking to, and you're the lawyer for the organization. But you have to be a good listener. How do you be a good, first thing to be a good listener, how can you be a good listener? First thing is you have to plan the meeting well. You have to prepare for the meeting well. You have to have a proper checklist of the things that you want to elicit at the meeting. I mean, you can't just say to the client, well, what do you want? See, I mean, I think you have to be more sophisticated than that in your approach in asking the questions and drawing out the responses that are relevant to setting up uh, this organization. 
So uh, good preparation, also good preparation in, in what legal issues uh, can come up at that meeting. I mean, why waste the client's time? And why have billable hours if you're not prepared for the meeting? As I'm sure that some aren't. I mean, when we're in law practice, we're juggling a lot of things. But when we set a meeting time, we should be prepared for that meeting. And we should have what we need by way of checklist and, and uh, information and, and not just come in there saying, I don't know this and I don't know that. Confidentiality is another uh, issue. Uh, the, uh, as, as we indicated, lawyers often prevent clients from doing the wrong thing. So uh, I'm a very, very strong believer in confidentiality and in the, uh, the lawyer-client relationship, and, in the, and I believe it to be sacred. Uh, you have to, uh, the client has to feel that you, uh, you can be told things and that they won't be leak to others. You have, it's, it's a sacred obligation. And if a client feels that way, and if a client is not afraid to talk to you, it may very well be that not only will you do a good job in setting up the organization, but you may help society by preventing something wrong from being done. And you help the client by preventing something wrong from being done. So this is a very, very important, uh, very, very important factor. A very important C, confidentiality. And competency. Competency issues represent another area uh, for consideration. Now here we have a rule. Certainly, you have to update things if we haven't recently, very recently updated them. Uh, so we all are learning. It's a constant learning process, and that's one of the most exciting parts of the law. But we do have certain things that's just not economically feasible for us to embark on learning about those particular matters, and that it is better to get the specialist. Uh, I had a copyright matter when I was in practice, and I really knew nothing about copyright. And my client uh, was adamant that I represent that I represent him in the copyright matter. And I finally explained to him that it would take me at least two weeks to learn enough about it, and I wouldn't be sure then that I could compete with the guy on the other side who was accusing uh, my client of certain uh, irregularities in conjunction with copyrights. So finally. Um, uh, my client agreed to, uh, to to go to Philadelphia with me, where we went to an attorney who specialized in copyright law. And we explained the situation. He called in a secretary at that time. Uh, lawyers called in secretaries. I don't know if, if it's ever done anymore. And, uh, and he dictated a letter to the other lawyer. And it was a great letter. And. The whole project kept, took about two hours of, uh, of billing time. And so my client at that time <laughs> got a bill for about 300 bucks. And the case was immediately resolved <coughs> amicably. The other lawyer understood what he was saying, the guy in California, and he understood what this guy was talking about. And they had a nice meeting in the minds and the matter was settled. So my client saved a lot of money that way. And there are some things which you just would rather if I had a very difficult tax problem, I might want to contact Jim Delaney uh, uh, 
to, or, or Jan Perhoda, or, you know, people who are really into these fields. Deeply, or somebody in Tom, Tom or someone in his firm. Um, because I would be afraid to do it on my own. And, I, and it wouldn't pay the client economically for me to become that expert in it that I could comfortably handle it. The accountant is, has value. Uh, there's no doubt that many of us uh, know how to do the job for the most part. But there are certain matters that we need an accountant on when we're organizing a new business. This is how I feel. And I would say that sometimes the accountants are not up to, up to date with us or agree with us on what to do. Usually, of course, we're the ones who are right. Um, but it's sometimes we do run into some opposition and there can be inconveniences in having accountants. But, but on the whole, they can be very valuable, very helpful. Uh, make sure your client understands there's a difference in the confidentiality rules that a lawyer does have a confidentiality. Uh, and I don't know, uh, Jim, if there are many states that give them accountants confidentiality privilege. Uh, you can get a privilege if you retain them to the lawyer. It's what? So you can get the accountant to have a privilege if the lawyer retains the accountant the proper way. Okay, so if it's done in the right way, so it's some, not some, something you can't, you, you've got to be careful uh, to do it in the right way so that the privilege is not, is not lost. Uh, so who's responsible for filing the form? You know, you say you're going to do S corporation. Who should file the S corporation form? Am I doing it or is the accountant doing it? Uh, I thought you were doing it says the accountant, and the client doesn't have the yes corporation election or vice versa. So these are just, these are practical matters that you really have to, uh, uh, you have to work out. Uh, another thing on competency, I've been uh, going for a number of years in the American Bar Association summer uh, convention. And it is the best, as far as I can, and I don't get paid by them uh, to advertise them. But I think it's the best collection of continuing legal education programs uh, that you can get in one place very quickly. Um, a marvelous uh, place to, uh, to uh, stay in touch with what's happening in the world of practice. And CLEs in general. I mean, I've been to business planning CLEs that the ABA is sponsored. And not, not only to keep up, but just to get the framework. The business planning lawyers, people are working with it all the time. The framework that they are using in setting up new organizations. I think that's invaluable. And of course, to keep up to date, they're invaluable. CLE to me is not a burden. CLE to me is an opportunity if you pick the good ones and get to them. And by the way, going to the ABA uh, convention and attending the CLEs and getting uh, conveniently things presented to you that you're working on in practice, there's a side benefit too. You meet a lot of other lawyers there. And some of us do get work recommended to us by attorneys from other states uh, who need someone. And I, well, I met uh, someone so in Wyoming, and that's the one they feel comfortable calling. So, there's a certain degree of networking involved in ABA activities. It can be expensive to go to a convention and get stuck in a place like San Francisco or uh, New Orleans or, you know, they usually pick the places for their meetings. But it can be very valuable. So I, I do advise you to consider the CLE as, and the continuing education that's needed. Continuing education also is needed for the client. You set up the business, but how much attention do you pay after you set it up? You know, do you love them and leave them, or you continue on being a counselor to the business? I have been to CLEs where people who are in this field of organizing businesses and working with businesses said that they actually arranged to have a meeting at certain times with the clients to see what's new, 
with the business and to discuss things with the clients. <laughs> One of my sons uh, married a young who was a lawyer, and he married a lawyer, which uh, you can imagine a uh, marvelous combination. <laughs> and uh, she had the job of going to, um, to different firms, I think she was in Sydney, Austin, uh, and talking about employment law. She would go periodically uh, to companies and discuss employment law with them. Now again, I said a lawyer has to be a teacher, an educator, uh, has to explain things to clients very effectively and keep clients out of trouble. That's the ideal. And if clients allow you to do it, and this is not an excuse for you simply to make money, this is good for the clients. And she would go around and discuss, you know, the various employment laws, which are very complicated in the United States. She would periodically go to different companies and discuss that. Well, people in this business field, I think there's, a, there's definitely a, a, an important role for having a meeting like this periodically with your clients, having a set schedule uh, to go over things with them and to remind them about certain things in the law, to remind them about certain things that they should do Let's say even to avoid piercing the veil, which we heard discussed earlier. They may forget, you know, I mean, how much can you get across to clients and how much you need to remind them? They're not lawyers. So you, you want to keep them out of trouble. And I, I think a well-constructed meeting uh, periodically is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have Communication, competence, uh, uh, conf uh, the uh, conflicts, uh, and conduct, <laughs> behaving in an ethical manner and letting the clients know that that's the way you do behave. That's very important. Those are the C's that we start out with. The, I had a little talk about Harvard today. Um, uh, with, with, uh, Tom and I, who, uh, I think we both wonder sometimes whether it's more of a cross to bear, uh, because then people expect us sometimes to know something, or else they have something derogatory to say. Uh, it, it may be in jest, hopefully. Uh, but uh, I, I, and the dean mentioned that I uh, attended Harvard twice. I got two degrees, actually. Uh, from that venerable institution founded in 1636. I remember the orientation meeting that I had with my entire class, and I, I recall um, some of the things from that orientation meeting. Uh, this was my first week of school, and I remember, as an undergrad, and I remember the, the medical school dean spoke to our class. And the medical school dean said, I know that there are about, I know that there are about 300 and some students here who really are interested in going into medicine. He knew that from the applications, I guess they had statistics on it. We had a class of a little over a thousand. And he said, I want to give you some advice. Don't just load up with science and medical courses. Uh, Get a good, solid, liberal arts education while you're here. Because a doctor is a human being. A doctor should be educated in the ways of being a human being. That's a very important part of the profession. And simply knowing the scientific stuff isn't enough. And those of us who've been to positions, we've been to positions of all types, I'm sure. Some of them are very good from the human point of view. And some of them, uh, uh, you can leave their office uh, vibrating uh, from, uh, from the experience. Well, uh, I've carried that with me uh, through all these years, and of course the same thing applies to lawyers. Um, we, we, uh, we aren't, most people don't deal with us that much. Now sometimes, it is true, some people have uh, they have legal counsel and uh, and they talk to us a lot and sometimes companies with house counsel and, 
and some people talk to us more than they even like to themselves, and some people talk to us more than we like them to talk to us, but many of the clients we have, it's a very unusual experience to talk to a lawyer. And I, communication is some, one of the things that I brought up is very, very important. I mean, it's part of informed consent. It's part of our eliciting the information we need. It's part of our explaining to the client so we get an informed consent, which is crucial in all of this work that we're doing. So uh, being a good human being, we can be a good person and have the right moral values, uh, but uh, being a good human being involves good manners, too. Uh, Felix Frankfurter, a former Supreme Court Justice uh, of the United States, said that morals is good morals is 90-some percent good manners. Now, uh, we may not agree with his percentages, and uh, I'm sure he'd laugh if he were here today that we're quoting him on that, but, but it's, a, it's a good thing to think about. Uh, the good manners towards our clients, the way we make, have them feel at ease when we talk to them. Uh, there is in one of the rules here, at the, to at the top uh, rule of one, in the preamble, no, wait a minute, I got lost a little, a little bit here, but it's in, on the same page as the offering advice rule, right at the top. It says, in presenting, presenting advice, a lawyer endeavors to sustain the client's morale. That's, that's, in, that's in the rules of professional conduct. To sustain the client's morale, and they put advice in, in as acceptable a form as honesty permits. And to me, I, I think that's what lubricates the whole communications process. We have to keep this in mind. We have to be treating our clients in a professional way and in a human, good human way. So when we get an education uh, that uh, enables us to acquire the values and the, uh, the moral principles, which there's a lot of agreement on moral principles, not in all of them in our society, uh, how we treat our fellow human beings is a very important part of that. And it's not something you shed when you get to the office. And how we treat our, our, our fellow lawyers, too, uh, with civility. That's a very important part of this. And there are places where people aren't treated with civility. There are places where lawyers may be more perceived as backstabbers than other lawyers. Uh, so uh, it, it is a problem in the legal profession. So sustaining the client's morale. Now that means uh, not only in the kind of questions we ask, but in the reactions that we give to what they tell us. Uh, we, uh, we can have inadvertent reactions. I remember a situation where uh, a client explained to me that uh, she and her husband were about to do, to do something uh, in the law that the nice thing it was. And you're a, they had a lot of trouble uh, carrying forward with their plan. And she told me a number of years after that when she, I was not a lawyer, that when she explained it to me that I made a, some kind of a face which indicated that she would have very serious problems. And uh, believe me, I wasn't even thinking about anything like that. I didn't even remember, but even the facial expressions that we have when we're dealing with clients can make them uncomfortable, can make them feel like they've done something wrong. It may just be we're getting a bad headache, <laughs> you know? And uh, we, we have to be very careful in how we deal with our fellow human beings. Uh, a few years ago, um, we had a situation where the Humanities Council asked us if we would be interested in doing CLEs on law and humanities. And we accepted. I don't know if anybody here ever attended any of those CLEs, but uh, in the state of Massachusetts, the Chief Justice of the Court uh, asked a uh, a scholar at Grand Lakes University to prepare CLEs on law and humanities. 
And part of the reason was because judges, he said, uh, were, the Chief Justice felt that a number of the judges were victims of burnout as judges. And of course, burnout is a problem that lawyers also get afflicted with from time to time, and maybe some of them permanently. So one of the ideas was to get around the state and to do CLEs about great books. And to have the lawyers would read the books, and then we would have discussions on the books, and we'd be talking maybe about justice, and fairness, and, and things that people day to day in practice maybe don't get a chance to really talk about. In fact, one of my former students said, Professor Gill, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I haven't even thought about justice in, in, in all these years now that I've been practicing. And so the, uh, the, the thing is that if we, if we continue to think about these more noble ideas in our profession, uh, and that it's something beyond just billable hours or hours in charge, and that it's something beyond you know, just the, the normal thing, that, but that we're supposed to make society better and the world better. I mean, we have a big responsibility as lawyers. We have a lot of power as lawyers. Tremendous power. Sometimes we wonder, you know, do we really? But, but when you think about it, this is a very legalistic society that we're in. We give people legal advice. We can take things into court. What we say people think mean think is right somehow. So we have a lot of power in our society and we carry a, a responsibility with that also. So I, th I believe, uh, uh, therefore, uh, that uh, uh, we have a responsibility to learn, to be competent, to be good human beings, to do a good job for our clients, to give them good advice, to communicate so that there's real informed consent, to do all the things that these rules of professional conduct would require us to do. Uh, I think I'm about three, four more minutes, right? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Competence, I thought about, you know, as I was coming over here, I thought about the competence issue. And, and if you're not well prepared, and if you don't give your clients advice from a well prepared, prepared perspective, you're perpetrating a fraud on your clients. You, uh, that's serious. To have the interviews, to discuss, to give advice, you have to really know what you're talking about. And this is one of the reasons that I've always said it's very difficult to give an off-the-cuff opinion. Clients may stop us at a party, they may stop us uh, at a wedding, uh, they may call us at 11 o'clock at night because something's bothering them. Uh, there are all kinds of situations where people want to get advice from us. And law students, I'm sure people even come up to you and, are, and you can say, well, I'm not authorized to practice law. And what does a lawyer say to them, you know, when they stop the lawyer at a particular party or something and ask for advice? Well, an off-the-cuff opinion is really dangerous because you haven't prepared for it. You may not be in your best frame of mind to think it through clearly. And you have to know how to delay the client's uh, desire to, for you to give it. The client may say to you, uh, Dan, didn't you go to law school? What do you mean you can't answer this right now? Right? Well, you have to be able to answer the client. And for your good, I've got to think about this and do some work on it and prepare to answer it. And, and, and not be trapped into giving that off the cuff of it. And the same thing with business decisions and business organizations. Uh, you, you've got to be very well prepared when you're ready to put your opinion down in the client's mind or on paper. Uh, and I think John Berman, who's the dean of the ethical uh, rules in Wyoming, uh, I think he's often emphasized to students that when you sign your name on a piece of paper, that's a big thing. Uh, that's a very important thing. You're putting yourself behind that. I'll close with this. I had an accountant call me one time and asked me for a legal opinion. And he said, I'm sending over a letter. The client needs an opinion letter. He sent over the letter. 
I didn't know what the letter was talking about. <laughs> you know, and, he, I, and I, uh, I said, I don't know. I called him up and said, I don't know what this is all about even. I don't know these facts to be true. I don't know anything about this. He said, oh, everybody signs these letters. That's what the accountant told me. The accountant was a good friend of mine and a good person. And I had to turn him down on this. And, you know, particularly when you're a young lawyer, people will ask you to do things, you know, and they'll tell you, oh, everybody does it. And, uh, and what are you afraid of? And you feel like you're inadequate, you know? And I was much younger than all the other people involved, but I turned, I said, no, I'm not going to sign this letter. Get it from somebody, you know, talk to somebody else, or I have to be told what the information is and be satisfied. So watch out for that, too, when you're practicing. Be very careful. Thank you.